Okay, um, so I am going to show you a counterexample to Fermat's last theorem, and I don't know how that question mark got in there. <laughs> so just as a quick reminder, uh, Fermat's last theorem is a plus a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n has no solutions for positive integers a, b, and c, and n greater than two. This is, of course, one of the most famous theorems in math, first conjectured uh, in too tiny a margin in the early 1600s, and mathematicians spent several hundred years trying to prove this to no avail until 1995 uh, when Andrew Wiles came up with a proof. Well, he didn't actually prove Fermat's last theorem. He proved something seemingly completely unrelated that kind of brought together a whole bunch of threads to finally prove that it was true. But I'm here to tell you, Andrew Wiles was wrong. <laughs> My first suspicion was when I was looking at a description of his proof, and I saw it mentioned something about elliptic curves. And I looked through his whole paper, and I didn't see a single picture of an ellipse. So I started pouring through his whole paper, trying to look for what was wrong. Yeah, OK, I didn't even understand the first page. But I figured the simplest way to disprove something is to just come up with a counterexample. How hard could that be? So when I went looking and I finally found it, I could understand why no one had found it before, because this was a big number. I mean, a really big number. It makes Graham's number look, look tiny. So in order to sh uh, explain how this number works, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to how you work with really big integers. Normally, people talk about the most significant digits, passing some sort of value judgment on the digits in the number. <laughs> but it turns out that if you look at those least significant digits, all the ones over to the right, there's all sorts of interesting things going on. So I'm going to show you how to work with those least significant digits instead. So let's say we have two big numbers. These dot, dot, dots there just represent digits either we don't know or we don't care about. We just know the last three digits. So if you're going to add two numbers and you just know the last three digits, how many digits of the answer do you know? Well, exactly three, no more, no less. If you were going to multiply those numbers together, how many digits do you know? Well, multiplication is just glorified addition. I'm just saying add, adding 414, 618 times. So really, this is just addition. So again, you just know three digits of the answer. And this can be extended to exponents, integer exponents as well, because that's just multiplication, which is just addition. OK, so with that out of the way, I'm going to show you my number. I'm going to uh, unroll it a bit at a time. So everybody knows 3 cubed is 27. So if you just know the last digit of a number is 3, then you know the last digit of the cube is 7. Add a couple more digits, 543 cubed. That's something small enough that probably a few people here could do that in their heads. Or if you have one of those calculators that pedals in most significant digits, you could actually do this and figure out that the last three digits is 007. OK, if you have a calculator that can deal with 60 significant digits, and you can type this in before I switch slides, you'll find that the cube of this is a long string of zeros followed by a 7. So let's crank this up to 50 digits. And by now, it's probably no surprise that if you cube this 50-digit number, the last 50 digits of the response, all zeros followed by a 7. <laughs> exactly, exactly, thank you. Uh, I'll pay you afterwards. <laughs> so. Let's give this number a name. We'll call it S, either for 7 or for Scott Sherman, whichever you, is easier to remember. Personally, I find the latter easier. So now we can say that S cubed is a long string of zeros followed by 7. Now, I'll claim that I can give you an arbitrary number of digits in this, and it will always be a long string of zeros and a 7, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But now that we have that, uh, we can say essentially that 1 cubed plus s cubed is 2 cubed, which is about the simplest counterexample to Fermat's last theorem you could come up with, as long as you're willing to accept an infinitely long integer. <laughs> so the last thing that I want to show is I have a really elegant proof that you really can get as many digits as you want of s, and the cube is always a long string of digits and 7. But unfortunately, 
uh, I'm out of time, so the, <laughs> the talk is too short. Thank you.